Alrighty. Well, if you will remain standing, if you will remain standing for the reading of God's Word. Uh, for those of you I've not yet met, my name is Josh. I serve as the lead pastor here at ICON. And our scripture reading for today comes out of Matthew 28, starting in verse 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Let's pray. Father, I, I thank you for your word and that you've, you've given us something so concrete to, to build our lives around as individual Christians and as a church. You've not left us to figure it out, even as we talk about today being sent on mission. You've, you've not left us to figure out what our passion is or what we want to do or what we should be doing as a church, that's not guesswork. You've, you've given it to us. And so I, I pray that today as, as we talk about what it means to be sent on mission by Jesus, that you would get, give each and every one of us a sense of calling, that we would feel included in on this, God. And even this text that is so familiar to any Christian, to the, the Great Commission, I, I pray that it would not be dull to our hearts God, that you would reawaken in us a sense of urgency and a sense of desire to share the good news of Jesus Christ, that we would relish in it so much that it would be a reflex in us to want to live it out in front of other people. And we know that that's a work that only your spirit can do. And so God, would you unite your power with my weak words and as a consequence, bear the fruit of of evangelism, and of discipleship in our church. God, we, we trust you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to tell you about a, a family. Uh, one, of, one of the sons is one of my good friends, and this is a family that uh, it, it seems like there's almost this generational blessing that's on this family. It's the, it's the weirdest family I've ever seen. Um, so there's five sons, and every single one of them are just the like legitimately, I don't use this word in a cheap, like cultural way, the coolest people on earth, you know? Like they are so awesome. One of them is a professional skydiver. It's what he does. It's just like his day job. Uh, one of them, the youngest son named Aaron, uh, a few years ago started a band and within a month, just because of some connections he had, uh, him and his band was playing at Fashion Week in Milan. Super cool. Um, and then one of them, who, who's actually my friend in that family, his name is Brett, uh, this guy is one, of the, is one of those entrepreneurs who can touch literally anything and it will turn to gold. And even, even the dumbest ideas. I'm going to share with you some dumb ideas that have turned to gold. So, so him and his buddy, this is, uh, this is how he started to get into business. Uh, Brett and one of his friends uh, were on a road trip one time and uh, they got lost in New Mexico. And as they were trying to figure their way out through New Mexico, they just kept saying this phrase, hey, let's, let's just keep exploring. Uh, let, let's just keep exploring. And then it kind of hit them. They were like, that's kind of a fun little phrase. We should build a business around that. And so they did. <laughs> they literally built this business around this one little phrase, keep exploring. And it became an online movement just because they started it on Instagram. And they had all this little, uh, like, keep exploring gear. And they had uh, this flag that would, uh, they would encourage people to take wherever they went exploring. Uh, one of those flags went to the top of Mount Everest all because they just were saying that phrase. And they're like, hey, we should try this out. Um, and then they got tired of that and sold that business a couple years later. And then <laughs> Brett, as he was finishing up his undergrad in graphic design, uh, he, he was doing this little design of a gnome. And <laughs> I don't know how his brain works, but, but one night he was like, hey, the word gnome and cone rhymes together. I should open a snow cone stand called Gnome Cones. 
And he's just like, that's what I want to do. And so he, he took this project that he was working on and opened a snow cone stand called Gnome Cones. And it, it, one day it made the cover of Dallas Magazine of like one of the coolest, hottest new spots. <laughs> it's so weird. And, and he's the one son who I've always been so jealous of in that family because I am not an entrepreneur. Uh, I'm not the type of guy who can just take an idea and run with it. I'm more of a, of a rebuilder or a renovator. Hand me something and I can try to make it better, but I can't build it from the top up. Um, but it, it connects to the sermon here. <laughs> I remember Brett always talking about having to, to get investments for that original uh, gnome cone stand. <laughs> Uh, trying to go to serious people with serious money in order to build uh, not just one uh, snow, snow cone stand, but also one that actually ended up in a, in a downtown building. And, and he always talked about the, the number one thing you have to do when you're trying to get real people to invest in a snow cone stand is to tell them why. <laughs> Why? Well, why in the world should I give you thousands of dollars to, to renovate this old little building in order for you to build a snow cone stand that came into your head because you thought gnomes look cool for your graphic design? Why should I do that? That's, all, that's always the question that an investor is going to ask. That, that question of why. why. Why are you doing this? Why should I be involved in this? And if you haven't noticed, that's what this entire fall series is, is all around. <laughs> Why? Why are we here? Why does Icon Church exist? Why should you want to be a part of it? Why, why, what are we even doing here? And today, as we go through this last value of our church, one of the most important whys comes to the top. So the, for the last... Five weeks, we've been exploring the, the values of our church, and we've talked about being Jesus-centered and spirit-empowered and grace-oriented, all these things that really terminate here, that, that really stop here. And it, if we don't have today, what, what we're going to talk about today, then what we've talked about in the last five weeks doesn't really mean anything. I don't care how grace-oriented we are if we're consistently only about ourselves. If we don't have our eyes out toward the city in which God has placed us, I don't care how grounded by scripture you are. We've got to be sent on mission. We've got to think about who has God placed in our life? What neighborhood has God placed us in that we can be intentionally missional about? Because if we don't have that, if, if we don't have eyes toward the city and eyes toward those around us, then ultimately these, these five values that we've explored in the last five weeks, it makes us spiritually incestuous. <laughs> That's a weird phrase. <laughs> Write that one down in your notes. Palo, don't put that on Instagram. <laughs> but that's what it is. It's keeping this thing all in this little group of people when it's supposed to be spread out, supposed to multiply out. And I, and I hope that that phrase feels a little gross to you because it is gross. It is gross for a church to be grace-oriented and never actually invite anyone into relationship with Jesus. It, it is gross. It should be shocking if we find a church that is grounded by Scripture or Spirit-empowered and has no attention paid to the city that it lives in to the people that surround it. And so today, as we talk about being sent on mission, I hope that you'll sense the necessity for us to, for lack of a better phrase, export what's going on here, what God wants to do here out into the city. So we're going we're to talk about being sent on mission. And we're going to look at this text in Matthew 28 and see exactly what this mission is what, what have we been assigned to as Christians and as Icon Church, and then get into how that might work out in our, in our real lives. So, so for this, this text today, what I want to do is just kind of run through it and give uh, some analysis. Um, we're we're going to run through and see what's actually going on here, and then at the tail end, we'll actually talk about 
what that means for us as a church. So put your thinking caps on. If you have your Bible, would you open it or open it on your phone? Um, I, I think it's really important for you to see kind of where we're at in the text. So let's jump in. Matthew 28, starting in verse 16. Now, the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. Okay, stop. These verses note a place. And if you remember what I, what I talked about in that short video that I filmed a few weeks ago, when you're trying to understand what's going on in the Bible, if it, if it calls out a certain type of place or a certain location, you, you, really, want, you really want to pay attention. So, so Galilee, that's where Jesus himself directs these disciples to go. Why is that important? Well, throughout the Gospel of Matthew, Galilee has been the, the home base for Jesus' ministry. The disciples are directed by Jesus to get out of Jerusalem and to come back to Galilee. Jesus takes them out of the place where everything just happened, where they were, Jerusalem, which is where the cross and the resurrection, all the big things happened. Jesus says, come out of that and go back to Galilee. Meet me in Galilee. He wants to bring them back where the majority of his ministry and his teaching took place. He doesn't want to give them a commission where everything happened with the cross and the resurrection, but where he himself did his ministry. And this is meant to show that Jesus, for these disciples, is both geographically and metaphorically taking them back to where he did all of his ministry. He's trying to to hint at continuation that Jesus and the commission he's about to give these disciples, which we'll jump into, what that commission is, is a continuation of what Jesus has been doing all along. They're not about to be commissioned into something brand new, but they're to simply continue what Jesus has been doing all along, ministering to people and teaching the Bible. It's meant to portray, he calls them back, in order to portray the necessity to go and carry on what Jesus has been doing all along. So after that, after he invites them back to Galilee, he gives them an actual commission. Look, look at the next verse. And when they saw him, the disciples, they worshiped him, but some doubted. I love that, don't you? The resurrected Jesus is there, right there. And people are like, I don't know. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So that, that, that's the commission that Jesus gives these disciples. And let's, let's look at the, really the two main elements of this, okay? First, this commission that Jesus gives, he gives them confidence in his authority. Before Jesus tells them to do anything, he tells them what's happened to Jesus. That he has received all authority in heaven and on earth. What the disciples are about to be sent out to do, they are not doing it just from a place of their own weakness, but from a place of power purely because of who it is that's sending them. The the weight the responsibility, the, the task of what Jesus is going to give them here, it's not a crushing weight because they're not carrying the burden on their shoulders. They're not being sent out with just a flicker of hope and a little sparkle of inspiration. Rather, they're being sent out, commissioned by the one, the one person who has all authority within himself to get the job done. Jesus possesses all authority in heaven and on earth. So Jesus is the person that everything else answers to. Hard stop. If Jesus wants something done, it's going to get done. Hard stop. Jesus possesses all authority that it's going to take to make this commission, to make this task actually get worked out. 
This is the type of authority that the disciples can, can lean on. And not, not only because Jesus' authority is full and complete, but also because it's a received authority. That's, that's what he says, right? All authority has been given to me. Jesus didn't do this through, through conquest. He didn't wrest this authority from the, from the arms of God, but it has been freely given to him. He's received it. And this is important, okay? There's a, there's a little uh, connection back in Matthew's gospel at this point. This is an echo back to Matthew 4, where, where Jesus is being tempted. And, and do you remember what the temptations of Jesus are when, when Satan is tempting him in Matthew 4? First, he, he tempts him with, with bread, right? Jesus has been fasting for 40 days, uh, and Satan says, hey, you're the son of God. Why don't you just turn these stones into bread? Jesus answers him and says, basically, with a, you know, I, I, the, word, the, the food that I need is the word of God. It's not this. I won't be driven by my stomach. And then Satan tempts him a second time, and he takes him up on top of the temple there in Jerusalem, and he says, hey, God's your father, right? Why don't you test that and throw yourself off of this temple and see how angels come and rescue you? It seems like a good plan. But Satan is really tempting Jesus to question God's attention and care for him as his son. But then the third temptation, Satan takes Jesus up on a mountain. There's a connection there. And he says, if you bow down to me, you can have all of these nations. You can have power and control over all of these nations. If you'll just bow down to me, you don't have to go through the cross. You don't have to submit to God. You don't have to obey God. You can do it the easy way and just get power right now. And Jesus refuses that, choosing to submit himself to God the Father, to go the route of the cross and the resurrection where he will receive authority rather than have it grabbed for, for him right then and there. Jesus' authority, Jesus didn't short-circuit his path to power, but it's been given to him directly, and he, he received it through the right channels. So he has a, has a good authority, okay? And then second, what are they actually commissioned to do? So that's the first element of the commission, that, that Jesus is giving them confidence in his authority. And then second, what are they actually supposed to do? Go. <laughs> just, just go. Don't stay here. Don't just ride off the good vibes of the resurrection. But instead, go out and proclaim the gospel. Don't keep it for yourself. Go out. Don't keep it for yourself, but get this thing out. Get it out to the community and invite all nations to believe this good news of Jesus. And then once they do, here's how you make them into disciples. You baptize them, and then you teach them. Jesus says, baptize these new disciples. Why baptism? Again, we're just analyzing the text, okay? Baptism is, is meant to be an act in which we, we, we demonstrate and we identify our allegiance. That, that's what baptism is. And baptism is not a, a Christian thing, actually. It was happening all over the ancient world as people were baptized to ancient gods or to certain uh, lifestyles, committing themselves, pledging their allegiance to these pagan gods and to these lifestyles. And Jesus here says... Go and get those people. Go proclaim the good news of Jesus and pull them out of those allegiances to idols to the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In other words, to, to make disciples is to have them shift their allegiance away from idols, away from these lesser things, and to identify themselves with the living triune God. And then after that shift in allegiance, go and teach them. Teach them everything I've shown you, everything I've told you to observe both in my instruction and in my lifestyle. Teach these others what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a disciple, to identify themselves with Jesus. That's what's going on in this text. Super easy, right? You guys could have done that, right? You could have done that. It's easy. But what in the world does that mean for us right now? 
Why does that matter? What is this trying to tell us about Icon Church? Two things. There's two things that I really want to lean on today. If we're going to talk about being sent on mission, there's two things from this text that I really want us to grab onto and commit to, okay? First, this text tells us, and again, this is obvious, that our mission is disciple-making. That's what we do. We, we make disciples, and that might seem obvious in principle, but it is not so obvious in practice. It might, it, it, we might say, yeah, that's, that's pretty obvious, but are you making disciples? Are you, are you making disciples, both new ones and growing ones? Because that's the task. That's the task, to make disciples that are both new disciples and growing disciples. And there's a, there seems like there's always this question around the church of, of who does the church exist for, right? Have you heard this question or encountered this question? Is it just for people who don't know Jesus? Is it just for people who already identify with Jesus and as Christians? And all kinds of churches provide different answers to that. And our answer is just, yes. The church exists. The mission of Icon Church is yes to make new disciples, to call out people away from idols and to have their allegiance shifted to Jesus, but also for you here. Mission is all about your personal discipleship as well, to become a more fully formed disciple of Jesus. Which means this, this is where this applies to your life here at Icon. You should expect that icon will push you to grow in your discipleship. Will push you to grow in the expression of your allegiance to Jesus. I'll get to those who are new disciples in a second, but for you personally, do you come to this church in order to grow as a disciple or do you come just to play church? And that exists in Seattle. I know we're in a really hard spot, but there's a, I've met Christians who are still playing this whole game and aren't really serious about their discipleship. Is that what you're here for? Are you here to grow as a disciple or are you just an interested onlooker? Do you come to Icon because you want to, to grow in observing all that Jesus has taught? Or do you come simply because it's the, it's the Christian type of thing to do? Please don't pass over that question. Please don't assume the answer to that personal question. Really reflect on that. Do you want to grow as a disciple? Or are you just here? Is this, the, is this just something you do because maybe you moved from another city and you came to Seattle and you just find a new church when you come to a new city? You show up to church, you go to community group. Are you just doing the thing? Or do you actually want to grow? What's your level of commitment? Not to Icon Church, but to discipleship to Jesus. To be shaped and to be formed. Because my hope in this being sent on mission, if our mission is to make disciples, my hope, if I'm totally honest with you, is that, listen, you can surely be in process here at Icon. Without a doubt, we just talked about being renewed as community and grace-oriented. I'm not talking about being a disciple who's still in process. I'm talking about being a disciple that at least cares. And if you are not committed to your discipleship, if this is still something that you're just playing the game in, my hope is that because of the, the other disciples of Jesus that take it seriously, you'd feel really uncomfortable. Challenged even. Pushed to analyze your commitment to your own personal discipleship. I hope that you'd feel challenged in that. Icon is a safe space to still be in process. It has to be because we all are. But that doesn't mean it becomes a place where stagnancy is either celebrated or brushed off as no big deal. 
If the mission of the church, if the mission of ICON is to make disciples, then that means we come to ICON in order to slowly, over the long haul, not miraculously, not suddenly, but over the long haul, progressively grow as more serious disciples. My hope, my prayer this week is that you would want that that you would genuinely want to grow. You would take this thing seriously. And then second, what this text means for our mission as a church. It means that there is no reason, there is no reason to be intimidated by the task of making new disciples here in Seattle. Humbled by it, yes. (laughs) Sober about the task that's in front of us, sober and clear-headed, clear-eyed about the opposition to the gospel, of course. (laughs) But being intimidated into silence, that's different. Being so worried or intimidated by our mission field that we don't say a word, that's different. And this text shows there's no reason for that. Because Jesus, the one who has all the authority to make this thing happen, is the one sending us. So you don't have to be crafty. You don't have to be compelling. You just have to trust Jesus. You just have to look at him and see that he holds everything necessary, everything necessary for you to be a confident, dare I say it, open Christian here in Seattle. To not, to not shrink back. If Jesus has all of the authority in heaven and on earth, if, if, if the buck stops with him and he's the one who's sending you, really, what are we so afraid of? If that's true, then why is it that the moment something about Jesus comes up, we kind of shrink back a little bit. I feel that too. I'm not, I'm not just pushing and challenging you. I feel that too as your pastor. <laughs> my, my barista at Starbucks, I know I go to Starbucks. It's like the easy option, okay? I know there's better coffee, but it's easy in the morning. My barista at Starbucks knows that I'm a pastor, but the first time that he found out was maybe the second or third opportunity for me to make known that I was a pastor of a Christian church. <laughs> There were opportunities before that, and I just felt intimidated because, well, one, like, what's really going to happen here? Like, am I going to, he's my barista, am I really going to be able to share the gospel anyways, you know? Don't we excuse ourselves out of it? (laughs) I don't have time to share the gospel anyways. He's so busy. No, what it was was fear in my heart. Why was that in me? Because I don't see that Jesus has authority over Jonathan's life to pull Jonathan in, to invite him in. And now, guess what, guys? Now, every single Sunday morning, when I get to Starbucks super early in order to finish everything and review everything, he asks me now, hey, what's your sermon on today? <laughs> That's amazing. He wasn't, a, he wasn't a threat. He didn't see me as a threat. He's simply curious. And whether he's just being a good Starbucks employee doesn't matter to me. He gets to hear every Sunday morning me tell him, hey, today I'm talking about being what it means for, for Christians to be sent on mission because we believe that, that what Jesus has done is worthy of everyone's trust and hope. I get to tell him that every single Sunday morning, what my sermon is. All because he just asked what I did and I finally told him that I was a pastor. <laughs> We can step into conversations like that when we believe that Jesus has authority. We don't have to fear. An unhealthy fear of of our mission field, of what this city is, comes not because we see its difficulty only. It's not because you are sober about the reality of the opposition to the gospel here in this city. It's because, deeper than that, we think the authority of Jesus is not enough, or we just don't think of it at all. We, we, we do think, like, like Paolo said, we, we fall into that temptation that we think about it. It's up to us. But if we see that Jesus holds in himself all authority 
in heaven and on earth. That means we can be confident in at least sharing that we're a Christian. You don't even have to share the gospel. You have to share, yeah, I believe in Jesus. If we're going to be a church that's sent on mission, we have to recognize that Jesus has all the authority it's going to take for you to talk to that person who you know is not a believer. You can have confidence in the authority of Jesus. Because here's the thing. Jesus plus one is always a majority. Jesus plus no one is always a majority. He is always in the majority category because of the authority that he has. Convincing people to become disciples of Jesus, for them to see the beauty of the gospel, is not about winning an argument or even having a com- or compelling people with our lives of love. Those are important for sure. But ultimately, the way that it happens, the reason it happens, is because Jesus is in control. That's what tips the scales in every person's heart, yours included. That's how you became a Christian. It was not because you were grown up in a Christian family. If you are a Christian, it is because the authority of Jesus acted on your heart and tipped those scales over into faith. And he can do the exact same thing with whoever else is in your life. So I I, I know that, that many, I've had conversations where you are intimidated by co-workers and neighbors. I understand that. Being a Christian in Seattle feels like you are constantly existing in the periphery. It's not a seat of power. It's not a seat of power or cultural currency. It's one of existing on the periphery, tossed to the side as meaningless or at worst, dangerous. I get that. But just because the periphery is not a seat of power does not mean your confidence in living out your faith should wane. The the confidence we have in sharing the gospel with coworkers or neighbors does not come out from our place in culture, but Jesus is placed on the throne. Who cares that we don't have a seat of power? He does. We don't need that. We don't need a seat of cultural currency having the attention of our city. We don't need that because Jesus is already sitting in a place of power and authority. And because of that, we can be sent on mission. We can have confidence. We don't have to shrink back. You don't have to, friends. You can live out your faith. You can share the gospel. You can be open. You can have conversations like Paolo was talking about without fear, without feeling you've got to figure it out. Like you've got to be convincing enough. You've got to be compelling enough. All you have to do is open your mouth and trust that Jesus is on the other side of that conversation full of all the power it's going to need to turn that person's heart back to the Lord. That's it. That's what it means. Those are, those are the two things from this text that I want you to see for us to be sent on mission. That our mission is to make disciples, which includes you taking your discipleship seriously. And our mission is carried on with confidence because of the authority of Jesus. And I, I really want you to feel that you are included in on this today. This is not organizational values of Icon Church. This is personal discipleship values of Icon Church. You specifically are sent on mission. Not just ICON as an organization or as a, you know, we meeting in this building. You, as a personal disciple, you are sent on mission. It's not a question of if you are called. It is a question of to whom and where. That's all you got to answer. To whom am I called and where? You're included in on this. And so here, here's what I want you to do this week, Okay. Even right now, how about this? Take out your phone. Call a... I'm just kidding. (laughs) Really, though, take out your phone. And I want you to write down in your notes or whatever, a place that you'll remember it, the name of just one person. One person in your life who you know is not a believer in Jesus. Who you can pray for, that you can commit to prayer in two ways. One that God would give you opportunity to share the gospel, and then two, 
that you would actually do it. That you would actually step into that. Just one person. It doesn't, we're not here to save the city, guys. <laughs> we're not here to turn the tide of Seattle. We're here to be faithful and plant seeds along the way. So what's one person who you can share the gospel with, who you can pray that the Lord will give you opportunity to share the gospel, and you can pray that God will give you the confidence to do it. That's a practical application of being sent on mission. And if you don't have anybody to write down, that might be your point of conviction for today. Do you, do you know people who are not Christians? That's what it means for us to be sent on mission, guys to take our discipleship seriously and to rest in the authority of Jesus and actually live it out with people, having conversations with just one person and slowly living it out. And to close, I just want to point out one last thing. There in verse 20, Jesus says this, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Right before Jesus sends them out, he says, hey, behold, look, pay attention. Arrest your attention here is what Jesus says. I am with you. Not I will be, but I am. This is not a task that I'm going to give you to figure out, and then I'm going to come back at some point and be like, hey, how'd it go? Jesus is with his people as they are on mission. And it doesn't give any qualifiers of success. It doesn't give any qualifiers of how many people you share the gospel with. He simply just says, out of grace, because he loves you, he will be with you. He is with you. That's the gospel application, the gospel connection to even mission, that this one sentence from Jesus is both our hope and mission, but also our hope in the gospel, that Jesus Christ regardless of where we're at, no matter the successes and failures of our lives, is with you at all times, Christian. That Jesus here on the heels of his death and resurrection says that because of what he's done, you do not have to fear, both in mission but also in your own personal relationship with the Lord. You can have hope. He is with you. He gives you comfort, whatever sins you have in your life. Whatever ways this week, like Kyle said, that you just totally dropped the ball, that you ran from the Lord, whatever guilt and shame you carried into this room does not divorce Jesus from you. He is always with his people. Regardless of success, regardless of outcome, regardless of failures, he is with his people people. And that's our great hope, church, both in mission and in relationship. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that these disciples took this seriously. That these disciples carried out the mission of the gospel, even unto death. And it's because of that that we're here today. Our salvation came through the lines of the centuries because these people were faithful to share the good news. God, give us inspiration to think who years from now could be safe and comforted and hoping in Jesus simply because we were faithful to this call. Men and women and children that we'll never meet but will be directly affected by our decision to be faithful to this commission. That our hearts wonder at that and by faith step out in obedience, sharing the, the good news of Jesus, calling people out of idols, those things that destroy our souls, and back into relationship with the one true and living God, Father, Son, and Spirit. So make us a church that takes our own discipleship seriously, that we grow, we want to grow, we we seek you, God, to be more conformed into the image of Jesus. And then we look at our city and we don't fear. We look at our city and we see opportunity, not because we're great, not because we're creative and compelling, but because Jesus is in control. 
and is with us always to the end of the age. God, give us comfort in that, and from that comfort, real action. In Jesus' name, amen. This teaching was recorded as part of our current sermon series at Icon Church. During our weekly gatherings, we move from the teaching to a time of response. While we recognize it may be hard to capture that as you listen online, we encourage you to take a moment to reflect on and respond to what the Spirit might be telling you in response to what you've heard. For more resources and to find out how you can join with us in gathering on Sundays, visit iconchurch.org. And as we say each week, Christ is all and we are His.